Hello, welcome to Outlaw Bookseller. Um, I was going to do a recent acquisitions and unboxing video today, but um, I decided recently to readopt a reading habit, which was probably my favourite reading habit in the early to mid 80s, when I was really getting an awful lot of reading under my belt, as one does when one's in one's early 20s and is completely on fire with, um, with literature. And I decided that I was going to start to binge read writers again to sort of either discover writers or read writers um, in depth. In other words, if you have a pile of six books by somebody, you read all six of them. And that's what I used to do. I mean, I burned through all sorts of people, both in genre fiction and general fiction that way, particularly in the early and mid 80s. And I decided recently to return to um, a writer called Stanislaw Lem which, um, you know, most people will know Lem as the Polish sort of Iron Curtain SF master, one of the most popular science fiction writers in the world, huge readership across the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, acclaimed by pretty much everybody, um, regarded as quite the difficult man and quite critical of American SF, with the possible exception of Philip K. Dick sometimes. And of course, I think for most of us, who over a certain age, we first discovered Lem through watching um, the film of Solaris. I'm not going to show you the cover of the DVD or the Blu-ray of that because we all know it. And that, of course, the Tarkovsky film. And then, of course, there was the more recent Hollywood version. The less said about that, the better. And I do believe there was a sort of TV series in Eastern Europe um, back in the 60s, which predates the Tarkovsky one. And um, I first read Solaris way, way back in the 80s. Um, and this is my old King Penguin edition, which has seen a lot of action over the years. And it also has Chain of Chance, which is a very sort of strange detective story. Um, and also Perfect Vacuum as well, which is, um, from what I remember, it's, um, it's reviews of um, books which, um, which, which didn't, don't actually exist. And I think it's been published, it's, yeah, that's the one, been published under another title as well. So if you're buying Lem, be careful for variant titles because two or three of them have, do have different titles in the UK. So what inspired me um, to go back to Lem recently was not the fact that there were some beautiful penguin modern classics series of the last few years. This is the Futurological, Futurological Congress, which is um, one of the first Lems I read. Um, so I rebought some because these are so nice. Um, but also the fact that Scott, Brad Scott Bradfield and his channel, I mentioned Scott a few times, he talked about Lem as well. I'm just going to give another shout out for Scott. This is one of his books. I've got others, but I can't find them at the moment. Um, and he's got a wonderful ch channel where he talks about all sorts of literature. He's a great guy. And I find him a big inspiration to me on, on my channel, I must say. So um, he's got a wonderful ramshackle approach and it comes straight, you know, from the gut and the heart. And he's a very, very funny guy as well. I really, really like his stuff. So do check out what Scott has to say as well. And he sort of drew my attention to some wonderful new editions of Lem's work from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, they're beautiful trade paperbacks. And I think there's about six of them. I've just read this one, Return from the Stars, um, which I absolutely loved. It's absolutely fantastic book. Lem, like a lot of writers from um, Russia, the former Soviet Union, um, and Eastern Europe, really from the birth of modernism, from the end of the sort of um, 19th century, they, they, they tend to have two modes. They have like a realist mode, and I would say this is Lem's, one of Lem's realistic science fiction novels, and then there are ones which are more fabular, um, which are more fable-like, and more playful and quirky in the Eurocentric tradition of people like um, Bulgakov comes to mind, and obviously even Italians like Calvino, Borges, of course, from Latin America, these sort of fabulous people. And this is one of Lem's more fabulous books, The Siberiad. And the Strugatsky brothers do that fabulous thing as well. Um, I'm not so keen on that aspect of the work. It's interesting, but it doesn't always grab me in the semi the straight narrative says. Maybe I'm horribly conventional, who knows? But that's that's my initial thinking. But so I decided to, to look back at um, at Lem and buy some of the new editions, and that's absolutely beautiful, and I really love this. And this is about a man who returns to Earth after a long space mission, and of course, because of Einstein's theory of relativity, time dilation, the guys in the spaceship have been traveling at the speed of light or near. So they've been away for 10 years, they come back to Earth. And, you know, 120 odd years have passed. And many writers have done this. I mean, Joe Haldeman's Forever War is probably the most popular book, you know, in the sort of modern period that does that. And of course, H.G. Wells did it when, when The Sleeper Awakes. But reading it now at the age of 58, it really did make, make me think because 
it's kind of a metaphor for aging and the world changes you don't keep up or maybe you do if you're that sort of person um you don't keep up in the same way and you see culture changing i think culture is changing a lot these days because of identity politics social media what have you you know and, and one must accept that um one is becoming more of an anachronism and return from the stars really brought that home to me because the guys in this are sort of very very out of touch and there's a little um sf conceit in this which really made me think about the way that young people are now and the way they speak the way they're manipulated into using new speak not saying things how they're kind of pacified um because they're not all like that or you know not disrespecting young people entirely but it does make you think about how culture changes and um the the men in this seem like savages to a degree to the um the people of earth who they reconfront when they get back and it reminded me in a way it's like the mirror image version of flesh by philip jose farmer do you know that one where people come back and i think 600 years has passed on earth and earth's reverted to savagery and sort of sexual rights and um people are wearing antlers and stuff like that and um it's a great great fun book if you've never read it and it did remind me of that so i just really enjoyed that so looking at um doing my lem binge um in a day and a half i devoured this the invincible which again beautiful trade paperback lovely sf cover there with a the rocket on it last night and this this i wasn't so keen on this is probably the most straightforward lem book i've read um but what comes across in all of these is that one of the things that lem is interested in and it's it's a big thing in solaris is of course is the problem of knowledge and the limits of what we can know and he obviously took this question very seriously and then the way he approaches it again and again in his works is fascinating and, and about two years ago i read um this book fiasco which is a first contact book like solaris and it's absolutely superb and i can't really say enough good about it this is really serious hardcore sf pure sf um you know it's just wonderful this is the advanced reader thing i think this is what people should be aiming for when they're when they're reading pure science fiction to go into something like this if you can look at these old tropes these classic ideas like first contact it's this sort of thing you know it's not sagan it's not essentially arthur c clark it's fiasco and i really can't say enough good about this it's an absolutely amazing book and it talks about how civilizations most civilizations will get to a certain stage in development and they will wipe themselves out as we are probably just about to do so there are very few of them to contact out there in the universe despite its vastness because you know you get to a certain point and, and unless you're a very philosophical type of species you wipe yourself out so this is about this um and it's really really something so um I think Lem, because he's known most of this through the cinema and people know Solaris, it's worth pointing out that there are other films out there. Um, I'm sure there's more that we, from behind the curtain, that we haven't seen, we don't know about. But one that appeared a few years ago in second run is this one here, Ikari XB1, which is a Czech version of an early novel called The Magellanic Cloud. And this was made in, I think, 1963, which is the year I was born. It's black and white, it's stunning, and people often say, you know, it's a big inspiration to Stanley Kubrick, 2001, they watch this. And you can see it, you can see it. It's got very stunning electronic music, and it's black and white, it's very stark. It has some comic bits in it, there's a Robbie the Robot type character, which reminded me of Forbidden Planet from a few years earlier. Um, it begins with a sequence which is like a flash forward, which is something that The Outer Limits did at the time as well. You, you thrust in the middle of the story and you see a crisis moment. And... I have to say it's very good but I have struggled to get through it I found it quite boring at times and um, which is probably just my short attention span with science fiction cinema generally as I'm not even though I love film and I do like a good science fiction film I, I am very demanding of that. I want certain things but it's out there do get it it's really really good um, but as I say I do get a little bit bored with these sort of things I prefer I think for me this would work better as a shorter art film and I feel that's the case about a lot of um, SF films. They would work better as short art films. But, you know, it's worth seeing. If you, if you like space films, it's great stuff. So that's out there, because you can't get the Magellanic Cloud in English. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never seen a copy. Um, and going back to Lem, I said an early, an early read, which I've read twice. I reread this um, a while ago, and I read it decades ago, is this, The Futurological Congress. And... Um, this is more of an unusual book and 
Lem's got this character called Ishan Tichy and he ap appears in some other books and he's like an astronaut in the future and he goes to this um, convention in the future and he gets spiked with drugs basically and it really reminded me of Philip K Dick and the book in particular it reminded me of is um, Lies Inc which are in a course when the protagonist gets shot with an LSD dart and then it all goes very very trippy and the Futurological Congress is like that as well and I've always thought of that as Lem's tribute to Dick because even though they had a spiky relationship um, at the same time L L Dick was one of the few people that Lem would, would actually even tolerate as, as, <laughs> as a as a reader, but of course he read them in translation the same way that we read him in translation, so what can you do? So, um, and there is a film of that called The Congress, um, which is beautifully done, came out five, six years ago. Um, the initial part is absolutely fantastic. Um, the characters have changed, there are comments on science fiction cinema in it, which are interesting, and it's a realist narrative. And then about half an hour in, the hallucinatory part begins and it's all animation now i will say i'm not a fan of animation you know it's to me it's it's just the simpsons is just a cartoon to me it's not an art form i particularly relate to but it's really really inventive it's constantly changing so if you like animation and you like sf you really should tackle this and then it's got a a realist ending which is quite downbeat quite cronenbergian though it's beautifully lit it doesn't have those sort of brown tones that the dc tends to go for so watch out for the congress worth a look intelligent and interesting stuff so so that's the sort of futurological congress batch as it were so things to look out for so what am i going to read next with um with lem i'm i've got a few other mit things so i'll just show them because they're just so beautiful memoirs of a space traveler which is the sequel to the earlier um ijon tishi book the star diaries and as you see these penguin ones are nice as well so i've got that to read i read some of these I'm less keen on them, but I'm going to give them another go. That's lovely, as you can see. And also I have this, His Master's Voice, um, which is another sort of first contact thing about a message coming from the stars and the difficulty of interpreting it, whether it's an authentic method. And again, you know, we've seen these things from Carl Sagan or, you know, whoever. Um, but um, this is Lem. He, he tackles the problem of knowledge with great elan and... You know, it's, it's just wonderful stuff. So I'm looking forward to that because I'm seeing that as part of a maybe a thematic trilogy for me alongside Solaris and Fiasco. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And um, there are a couple of other books published by an MIT. There's his um, childhood autobiography, High Castle, which I haven't acquired yet, which should be interesting. And there's a Polish book. Um, sorry, Polish. A, a mainstream novel that he wrote that was banned in Poland in the late 40s when he was a doctor about medical life in a hospital called the Hospital of the Transfiguration and um, I'm going to sort of pick that up and have a read that because I'm fascinated to see what a mainstream novel with the, with a scientific background would be like him I'm sure it'll be fantastic some of my favorite novels are actually mainstream novels by science fiction writers I think often um, science fiction writers are underrated and could easily make careers in mainstream but because they need they write the novel of ideas they don't always um, find the meat there that's that's there in realism so I'm looking forward to that the jewel in the crown and again I must I must must cite Scott Bradfield because I'm ripping it off terribly here is this wonderful hardcover edition from MIT um, of the truth and other stories a lot of these stories have never been published in English before have been translated before and um, it has a Ford by Kim Stanley Robinson. Absolutely beautiful book, as you can see. Absolutely lovely. I couldn't resist that. It's not cheap. It's about £32.50. As I work in the book trade, I get a discount, so I got it far, far cheaper. But, you know, it's not going to be around that long. So if you like beautiful hardcover SF of the superior kind, you just sort of pick it up. So those are the MIT ones. Um, looking at the Penguins, I, I, do, I am going to retry Tales of Perks the Pilot, which... Um, I mean, if my friend Tim loves the title of this, and I found some of these so straightforward as to be mundane, but I've got a feeling I was missing something, so I'm going to go back to them again. So, so these, you know, these Penguin classics are all out there, they're lovely, and I think one of the most beautiful ones is this cracking short story collection, Mortal Engines. Now, Mortal Engines, of course, is, is a quotation and has been used many, many, many times for book titles. 
um, you know, probably most notably by um, Reeve, the chap who does the, the children's SF. Really good writer, actually. Uh, it's a good, good book. You know, he could crack it as an adult SF writer. You can see the influences of Christopher Priest, Keith Roberts, Michael Moorcock, but he could actually do it. So I've got that one to read as well. So I've got a load of Lem there to look at. Um, and, you know, I think if you want to tackle the problem of knowledge, I mean, I would I would really say look at his work. And and I've really enjoyed Return from the Stars. Um, Invincible, I felt, was a bit more routine. I'm looking forward to reading some more. Um, I've broken my binge rule already because I've started reading The Star Rider by Joyce Pesercia this morning. My next clip will probably be a recent acquisitions. I was going to do this within recent acquisitions, but because I'm in a lamb mode, I thought I'd just show you. And they're, they're just beautiful books, you know, and um, it's great to see a science fiction writer who isn't J.G. Ballard, who isn't Philip K. Dick, treated with such respect in the way the books are packaged and manufactured. However, I will say one thing. Would Lem, Dick or Ballard be treated with such respect by the mainstream literary world and publishing if their books hadn't been made into successful films? My feeling is that they wouldn't, because once they were out there and they got the attention and people liked them so much, and the critics found they liked them despite themselves, the critics of SF, despite themselves, despite the fact they wanted to diss SF, they found that there was something to them. So I'll leave you with that thought. Would Ballard, Dick and Lem be so revered today if it wasn't for successful film adaptations? And if they wouldn't be, what about the writers for whom we haven't seen successful film adaptations. Tom Dish, Robert Silverberg. We, you know, we could go on and on and on, all sorts of people. So I'll leave you with that thought. This is Outlaw Bookseller signing off in HD, Cromwellian, warts and all. So I'm going to go now and read some more Stanislaw M. Bye for now.